Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Thursday night here at Recovery. My name is Travis Wills, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at Powell Church. But most importantly, I'm a child of God, a God who freely gives his love and his grace to every single one of his children, freely. And make no mistake here tonight that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, or what's been done to you. You are a child of God, and he gives that love and grace to you as well. Now, even though we're children of God, we still struggle with loss and trauma, fear and our sin, but we believe that God holds us and helps us in our recovery journey toward healing and wholeness. We seek God every week together as we worship Him and pray to Him and learn more about Him, and we also practice the 12 steps, which we believe lay out an essential path in our recovery journey. And we're gonna recite those 12 steps together a little bit later tonight. Now we're a ministry that's in no competition with other anonymous communities or recovery ministries. So uh, we work alongside our brothers and sisters in AA, NA, Celebrate Recovery, or whatever other recovery service you may be a part of. So don't feel like you have to pick and choose. It can definitely be a both and. You can continue to be a part of our community as well as another recovery community as well. We would also love to have you join one of our open share groups, which we are currently facilitating through conference calls. And uh, they're completely safe, completely anonymous, and they help to have that encouragement and that accountability that we need in our journeys of recovery each week. So uh, Jamie is at the end of his message tonight. He'll give you some instruction and some numbers that you can use to call into those conference calls for our share groups a little bit later tonight. Now, before we go into a time of connecting with the heart of God together in worship, let us recite together the 12 steps of recovery along with their biblical expressions. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our compulsive behaviors, our addictions and our losses, that our lives had become unmanageable. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Romans 7, 18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God as we understood him. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Mark 12, 30. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We must search and examine our ways. We must return to the Lord. Lamentations 3, 40. Step five, We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Step six. We were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Romans 12, 1. Step seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? Matthew 7, 3. Step 9. We may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. When a man or woman commits any sin against anyone else, thus breaking faith with the Lord, that person becomes guilty. Such persons will confess the sin they have done. Numbers 5, 6 through 7. Step 10. We continue to take personal inventory, and when we are wrong, promptly admit it. And now, just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust Him too for each day's problems. Live in vital union with Him. Colossians 2, 6. Step 11. 
We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and power to carry that out. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17-18 And step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Well, Jamie's going to start our new sermon series on prayer tonight as we talk about what it means to commune with our Heavenly Father, which is actually what happens too when we worship. There's this beautiful collision. Sometimes it might be a beautiful mess where heaven invades earth, where God's very presence steps into the room and you can feel the atmosphere change. When his holy breath enters our lungs and we breathe it back to him as we worship, as we sing to his name, as we pray. So before we get into the sermon, let's just take a moment to pause, to breathe deeply the breath of God and to worship his holy name together. Let's sing this out.
continue to invite the Holy Spirit of God into the room that you find yourself worshiping in tonight as heaven invades and changes the atmosphere around us into a place where we can encounter the real love and grace, the healing that comes from the Father as we continue to worship his name tonight. is changing now and for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is
Jamie Bontnight, and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with issues around sexual integrity, codependency, and perfectionism, but thank you, Jesus, those things no longer define my life. My identity is in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Just want to thank you, Travis, for um, bringing us into God's presence in worship. We are so grateful. I am grateful to be here with you tonight, and I am grateful for Brooke and her message to us last week about what it means to worship, um, that we need to give God um, everything, to be all in with Him. Brooke, we needed, I needed to hear that message, and we needed to hear from you and to see you. Thank you. We um, appreciate your presence and your being with us every day as we walk in recovery. Um, so before we go any farther, let's pray. Abba Father, um, Lord, we come to you right now, just as we are. And we seek to know something of your presence in this evening and this time together. With everything that's going on in our world, Lord, we come to you. And we ask that you would make yourself known to us. And we continue to pray for Brooke and her family. We thank you for everything that you are doing for the um, successful surgery. We just keep lifting them up to you and we pray for full and complete healing and recovery. And that you will meet their every need every step of the way through your Holy Spirit. Help them to know a special awareness of your presence, Lord. And we offer this time to you. Oh. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going in the first week of a five-week series on prayer. Um, and in this series, we're going to look at different ideas about how to pray different ways that we can deepen our relationship with God and, and even some specific things like how to keep going in prayer when our prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling and go unanswered. And all through this series, I'll keep referring to a book called How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People by Pete Gregg. Pete spoke at a conference I was at last fall and um, I was moved by his talk and I bought this book, and I have read from it nearly every day since, and it has been a blessing to me. So we're going to use this idea that Pete has to guide us in how we think about prayer over these next few weeks. His acronym is PRAY, P-R-A-Y. Pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. We'll keep referring back to those many times. We're going to look at pause and rejoice tonight. Um, and we'll use the Lord's Prayer this whole time as our guide. The Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 9, excuse me, 6, 9 through 13, and in Luke 11, 2 through 4, two different versions. I'm going to use the version that we most often use here at church. It's the one that, that I most easily remember. And be glad for you to say this along with me. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So why, you might legitimately ask, are we going to spend five weeks on prayer? Well, from my perspective, perspective, when I look at the circumstances that we are facing in the midst of a global pandemic with our case numbers rising locally, with unemployment um, being a factor for so many people, with rising um, numbers of reports of domestic violence and relapse and overdose, 
with the situation where parents are trying to figure out how to go about school for their children this fall and where managers and employee employers are trying to figure out how do I keep my business going and care for my employees and customers. When we think about all of that, where else are we going to turn? When we are really knee deep in a crisis, what I would say to you is not great leadership that we really need. It's not even great ideas that we really need. What we really need is a great God, a great God that will carry us through, that will lead us through this and out of this. And we find connection with that great God in prayer. We talk about that very thing when we do the 12 steps in step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. That's what we're going to be talking about, how to improve our conscious contact with God. Our scriptural reference for step 11 is 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. The first words of that are pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Well, now, honestly, is that is that even possible? What if it is? What if there's so much more for us in this relationship with God than we have even dared to believe? What if what Jesus wants for us is not really a better prayer life, but for us to come to a life of prayer, where prayer becomes more like breathing? It It just becomes a part of who we are, not something we do, where it's not transactional, us trying to wring something out of God, though asking is a part of it, but where it's relational. It's us and God spending time together, enjoying each other's presence. Now, I'll just tell you right here at the outset, I don't know how you take all this, but for me, I pretty much resent it when there's some expert that comes along to teach me about prayer. I don't typically read books about prayer. I don't like it when um, people say, this is how you need to do it. And if you don't do this, you're missing out. And this is what you're doing wrong. And only if you do it this way, will it be meaningful. I just, I don't like that. I don't respond to that. If you've been around here for a while, you'll already know this, but just in case you're new and haven't figured it out yet, I am no expert. I'm just a fellow traveler on the journey right alongside everybody else. And there are times that I have to make myself go and pray because I don't want to. And I have slogged away at it for years trying to learn how to pray to improve my conscious contact with God. So my hope for this series is just to share some ideas with you. Um, Some things that I have learned, some things that I've tried that didn't click for me, but maybe they will for you. And I just encourage you to take whatever it is, take it to Jesus, talk to him about it, see how it shakes out for you. But don't, the intention is not for you to come out with the pressure to add 10 new things to your to-do list. That That's not the point. So let's start with God's love. We talk about that often. It's super important. We talk about how much God loves us. But do we think that God likes us? If we don't get there, I don't think that we'll be able to pray the way that God wants us to. If we don't grasp the incredible fact that he likes us, that that it pleases him, that he smiles when we make the effort to come and spend a few minutes with him. We sort of see this in the first words of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus addresses our Father. Think about that. The Father of Jesus Christ is our Father. And our Father, just like any father with his children, smiles when we come to him to be in his presence, to come to him just as we are. Prayer is important. In Luke 11, verses 1 and 2, we see this. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And then Jesus goes on to give what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. 
It's interesting to me what the disciples asked. They had walked with Jesus a long time. They had seen him do all sorts of things. They did not ask, Lord, teach us how to heal people or teach us how to cast out demons or teach us how to do miracles. They said, teach us to pray. Somehow with what they observed in the life of Jesus and what they heard him teach, they figured out that prayer was the foundation of everything about the way that Jesus lived his life. So may that become our request. Lord, teach us to pray. We'll touch on a few aspects of prayer every week, but to be honest with you, there's so much that I would like to offer to you for your consideration that I just won't have time to. So each week, Travis and I are going to make another video. It'll post probably on Monday with some more specifics, some ideas, us going back and forth talking about prayer. So I hope you'll tune in for that because there'll be some things in there that we just can't include in the messages in this series. Um, one of the things we'll include is this, how you could, starting at zero, structure a 15-minute prayer time because I believe everybody could find 15 minutes in a day so that at the end of a year, you will have spent 91 hours alone with Jesus. And is there anyone among us who would not be changed by spending 91 hours with Jesus? Pete Gregg gives us some advice about this, and he wants, it, he wants us not to complicate this. He says a sustainable prayer life um, has three keys. Keep it simple, keep it real, keep it up. And we see this in what Jesus says to um, his disciples right before he gives the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to look at Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8 in the message translation. Jesus says, And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. Keep it simple. Here's some ways we might keep it simple. Um, Jesus talks about a quiet, secluded place, and obviously that implies a time. And I would say that's the first thing for us to do in prayer. Um, where is the place that you have access to every day that God has already sort of set aside to meet with you? Some folks literally have a prayer closet, a little room with a door they go in. They put pictures and notes and stuff up there. Some just have a spot in their house. Um, some, it might be in their car or a place at their workplace. But there is a place for you. And when you find that place, it will be a blessing to you. Same with a time. When has God already set aside that he wants to meet with you each day? Not the only time you pray, but the time that you set aside intentionally to meet with God. Is it early in the morning, in the car, before work, at lunchtime, on the way home, a walk in the evening, or right before bed? It, it doesn't matter when it is. It's just that um, getting with Jesus and asking for guidance so that you can find that time that God's already ordained. And when you find that time, you, it'll be a blessing to you. So keep it simple and then keep it real. Jesus said right there, he talked about radical honesty. No role playing, he said. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. God already knows our heart. It doesn't, I don't think it really honors him when we have to say fake words rather than what we're actually thinking and feeling. So keep it simple, keep it real, and then keep it up. I'm going to use a quote from Bill W. on this one. It's from the big book, pages 13 and 14 where Bill W. says, belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. It's just like any other relationship. 
Spending time with each other is the basis for building trust and intimacy. Regular communication. Um, if you're married and you only told your spouse, I love you, when you were completely overcome with the emotion of love and affection, you wouldn't say it nearly often enough to build any level of trust or intimacy. What does Brooke remind us all the time? Our part is to suit up and show up. God will take it from there. The good thing is it's never about us or, and how great we are at praying or how big our faith is. In his book, Pete Gregg says this, Perhaps it's better, after all, to have a little faith in a great, big, unshakable God than to have a great, big, unshakable faith in a little God, completely unworthy of the title. So that's the foundation. Keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. And now we'll shift and let's look at the Lord's Prayer and the first couple letters in the praise sequence, pause and rejoice. We can use the Lord's Prayer. It can help us in two different ways. Uh, much like in the Serenity Prayer series, the Lord's Prayer will say it um, often enough that maybe we'll begin to memorize it and have it available to us whenever we need it. And it will help us to be able to have that inside of us. But we can also use the Lord's Prayer and look at what Jesus taught us there about the meaning of prayer and the components of prayer and use that as a guide or a format for our own prayers. And that format is pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Let's start with pausing. Most of us would be familiar with Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Now what's interesting is that declaration comes at the end of Psalm 46. And all that appears before that's an, an alternate, an alternating between the psalmist praising God and then the psalmist observing the chaos in the world, the mountains that are trembling and the oceans that are foaming and all the chaos. And it's from that that God says, be still. Just the idea of slowing down our minds, of centering our hearts. Easier said than done, though, right? It, at least that's true for me. I find this difficult to do. Um, I try and sit down and be quiet, and I think of a million things. Like, phew, they're just there. Um, but what I've learned is just to continue to show up over and over. No matter how distracted I was yesterday, I show up today and ask God to still my mind so I can sense his presence. And this pause is not preparation for prayer. It is prayer. It is seeking God. It is waiting on God. It's listening for God. And some days, honestly, I do experience his presence. Some days I don't. But I keep showing up for two main reasons. The first one is that I'm firmly convinced that it makes God smile when I make the effort to come and listen to him, just to sit quietly. And the second reason is I think it will certainly increase the chances I won't hear from him if I don't show up. Now, I know God can speak to us at any time, but um, I just I have un understand after many, many years that I have a better chance of listening to God when I'm trying to be quiet. And the Holy Spirit will help us. We don't have to do it on our own. We can just pause and relax and breathe and seek to come into an awareness of God's presence. We could get on our knees or lay flat down on the floor, but that might not work for everybody. Some folks might need to walk around to move their body so that they could still their mind. It doesn't really matter. It's however the Holy Spirit guides you. You and Jesus will figure out what works for you. And from that, from that pause, we can then move into worship, to rejoicing. Brooke reminded us last week, the definition of worship is to intentionally value God above everything else, to be all in with God. We see Jesus model that in the first and last lines of the Lord's Prayer. The first line, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the last line, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That is worship. The rejoice part of the pray structure 
giving worth and value to God. But who is this God that we worship? How we perceive God will define how we worship Him. And if we are afraid that this God is out to get us, we will come to prayer timid and fearful, just scared to death of making a mistake, and we won't possibly be honest with Him. And, on the other hand, if we just casually approach God as some dude we hang out with, we'll lose reverence and respect for Him. Who is this God that we worship? We worship the God who is great, and who loves us. The God who is absolutely holy and the God who likes us. The one who knows us completely and calls us with all of our stuff to come to Him. It is this knowledge of who God is that enables us to worship Him. And I know that we're going to talk about a lot of ways to pray and how to pray. It's the title of the book, How to Pray. But I think it's more about the little, the two little letters and the word to than it is the how. We learn to pray by praying, by going to God and saying, how do I do this? Teach me to pray. Trying to find not the right way to pray, but the uniquely Jesus and you, Jesus and me way that God wants us to pray. I want to close with a quote from Francois Fallon. It's from the Pete Gregg book where he said, Lord, help me not to worry about the words, but address you with the heart. I simply present myself to you. I open my heart to you. Teach me to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, there's a lot of stuff I couldn't get to tonight, so I really encourage you to tune in to the video that we'll post on Monday with some more ideas. On, on this area of the prayer series. And also, um, when you watch that video, just encourage you to leave a comment to me and Travis if you got any questions, if you've, if you're gonna, if you're experienced trying some of these things or even other ways that you have prayed and found that connection with God. Would really appreciate hearing from you about that. As always, thanks for being here with us on another Thursday night. So grateful that we can come together as a community. <laughs> Um, follow us on Facebook, please, as we um, keep working toward coming back with our groups in the building and back to worship in the building. We'll keep you posted on progress on all of those things. Um, thank you for those of you who are able to give. We are so grateful. We continue to be in ministry, um, sending out meals, reaching out in all sorts of ways. You can give in any of three ways. You can give online through the Church Center app or mailing a check to the church. And I just want to ask you to consider being part of one of our open share groups tonight. A secure conference call is the uh, vehicle for entering into those groups. It's a safe place where you can go and find connection with people who have struggles very similar to your own. Um, and also, let's ask you to consider being a part of one of the small groups that's built around this How to Pray series. I watch a series of videos that go along with that book. Um, they're easy to watch. They're pretty short, about 20 minutes each. So I just encourage you to check out the Pal Church website, palchurch.com, and sign up to be a part of one of those groups. And as always, let us close with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. And now wherever you are and wherever you're going next, may you go knowing that God is faithful and that God is powerful, that God loves you, and that God likes you. Go in peace.